right. So, uh, yes, if you still have your uh, Bibles open at uh, chapter 9, that will be a very good thing. Uh, so, uh, we're continuing our studies in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, one of the things we need to do in the Old Testament is always to look for Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, the Lord Jesus himself uh, said in John chapter 5, uh, speaking to the Pharisees and so on, you search the scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life. But these are the scriptures that testify of me. And Paul in Romans, uh, in Romans chapter 15 says, the things that were written beforehand, that is the Old Testament, were written for our benefit. So we can always find uh, things that will help us and things about the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament writings. Right, well, last time um, I wasn't here, but I understand that you were looking at, uh, at chapter 8. And uh, one of the things that you would have seen is that God's ways are, are inscrutable. You can't understand them. Uh, verse 17 of chapter 8. And I saw that all that God has done, no one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. Well, uh, I respect you know, um, Ecclesiastes was written uh, by King Solomon, reputed to be the, the wisest man in all the earth. And if he says, uh, even a wise man can't really comprehend it, uh, we, should, we should believe it. But uh, today, as, as back then, um, we have philosophers holding forth on the meaning of life, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, but invariably, one guy's explanation is contradicted by another guy's explanation. And then a third one comes along and muddies the water, as it were, even further. And uh, so we struggle. Uh, we struggle to find uh, a, a meaning. We struggle to find a guide. But the child of God humbles himself before God and learns from him. And the Lord would say to us today, in uh, the words of Psalm 46, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted among the earth. But Solomon's considerations, all the things he's been looking at, they've unearthed some treasure. So verse 9, I reflected on all this, I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 1, I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. So, the security of God's uh, people, the first thing that he's found, they're in God's hand. But who are the righteous and who are the wise men? Who are they and where are they? Where do righteousness and wisdom come from? Well, I'm going to take the wisdom first for uh, no particular reason. But to take a second, we read several times in Scripture. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding, Job 28 and verse 28, and you find it various times in Proverbs as well. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To shun evil is understanding. And the fear of the Lord in the Bible is always given as a very positive thing. And it doesn't mean a sort of craven fear. If you're a Christian, you don't have that craven fear. Perhaps you should if you're not a Christian today. But uh, it's, it's a knowledge of who God is, that he is transcendent that he is other than us, and that he holds our lives in his hands. And as I said, it's always given as, as a very positive thing in the scriptures. But, uh, so that is, is wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But righteousness, righteousness, where do we get that from? And, and how much do we need? How much do we need to qualify as righteous people ourselves? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul tells us in, in Philippians chapter 3, and, uh, and verse 8, uh, he says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by God. Okay. Our own righteousness will not stand before God, but it's flawed in so many different ways. We need a righteousness that comes from outside. We need the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection, the Lord Jesus 
has become that. And if we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, we find uh, it is because of him, that is God, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Our righteousness outside of ourselves, for within ourselves, we've got nothing to commend us to God. Paul says again, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. But uh, if, we, uh, if we turn to uh, Jeremiah in verse 17, we read, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water, that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when, when heat comes, its leaves are always green, have no worries in a year of drought, and never fails to bear fruit. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you are in God's hands, and he will never let you slip away. But then we come to uh, the next part of, of uh, chapter 9, uh, and verse 1, and uh, it says that uh, no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. Well, what does that mean? Well, Solomon, Solomon is looking under the sun again. He's looking at his world. And for what you see in the world, what goes on in the world, you would find it hard to know who are the righteous and who are the wicked. We read in Matthew 5, and verse 45, God calls us his son, S-U-N, that is, to rise upon the evil as well as the good. And he sends rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. And uh, reign of the righteous and the unrighteous. So uh, God has compassion, the Bible says, on all that he has made. But in the other provinces, it's hard to tell. Righteous Abraham becomes very rich. But so does evil Haman. Uh, wicked King Ahab dies in battle, jolly good riddance to him. But so does righteous Josiah. Where God's outward dealings with us, we cannot tell uh, whether we are loved by God or not. You remember Job's comforters. When they came to him and they saw the state he was in, all his sufferings, they immediately concluded that he must have sinned terribly to have suffered so much. But displeased God in that way. And in John chapter 9, uh, the Lord's disciples saw this man born blind. And they said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his father, that he was born blind? They thought he must have done something wrong, or his parents must have done something wrong, uh, that he was born blind. And of course the answer in those two cases, both cases, is no. There was no egregious sin that had caused these people to suffer. It was the glory of God to be revealed in people's lives. And uh, I was thinking particularly of a lady who may have read some of her books, Joni Erickson Tarder, mm -hmm. who... Uh, I suffered a broken neck, I think, at the age of about 17, and was paralysed from the neck down. And yet her life has been one glorifying of God. And uh, in heaven, there is, there is no paralysis, and there are no broken bones. Which, uh, so people will be pleased to hear. And uh, uh, <coughs> it will be well. But from under the sun, all we see is our, our ultimate end, death. Good or bad, rich or poor. You may be a king or a chimney sweeper, but everybody dances with the grim reaper. And whether you're rich or whether you're poor, it's not going to help you. As it is with the rich and the bad and the poor, the good and the bad, they all reach the same end. Now I believe that a chap called Elon Musk is the richest man in the world at the moment. Now when he dies, People like to ask, how much did he leave? How much did he leave? Well, the answer is he left it all, every last century. And he will have no say in anything that happens to all those billions he leaves behind. But he's dead. Whether they increase or decrease, whether his heirs invest them wisely or foolishly, whether they squander them or give it all to the poor, one way or other, he'll be gone. Gone to face his maker, who's no respecter of persons. And people would like to know. We'd like to know what is, um, is going on. We'd like to know how the things go, but they cannot know, except, except ultimately, uh, they're going to die. That's the one thing they can be quite sure of. But the righteous, says 
uh, says Solomon. The righteous, those who are unrighteous in Christ, uh, they are in God's hand. And this is what had troubled um, the psalmist Asaph. And uh, he, he was very troubled by the fact that wicked people seem to do so well. They seem to come along, they seem to be making lots of money. And, uh, all these things, he, he was shocked. He said, that for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. I, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They've got no troubles, their bodies are healthy and strong, they're free from the burdens common to man, and so forth. He said, oh, what, what, is, what is going on here? Why, why, is this, why is this right? And he says, surely, in vain, I've kept my heart pure. In vain, I've washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished every morning. These people are all doing so well. What's the point? What's the reason? Uh, and he, he sees men whose hearts are full of evil, and yet they're doing better than godly people. And it doesn't seem fair. But if we expect to see perfect justice under the sun, in this poor fallen world, we shall be disappointed. But the most wicked men, though they may live on the earth, their end will come. All the King jong King Jong-uns and the Vladimir Putins, they will come to the end. And Asaph says again, surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruins, as suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakens, so when you arise, the Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Death will take them, and after that, there is the judgment. So in verse 4, he goes on to say, anyone who is among the living has a hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. Well, the lion was viewed in ancient times as, as a particularly magnificent beast. Uh, uh, Solomon himself, writer of Proverbs, talked about the lion mighty amongst beasts who retreats before nothing, where dogs, uh, such, such as they were, tended to be curs and, and scavengers. But a noble lion is no good. His head is stuck and mounted on top of his wall, on some mantelpiece. Where there's life, there's hope. Either if you're alive, if a live dog, no matter how flea bitten and mangy it may be, it's alive. But there's life, there's hope. But having said that, having said that, I wouldn't want anyone uh, to lose all hope for loved ones who die without, so far as we know, repenting. Because God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. If you pray for your loved one, you did what you could. You did what you could for him. And you leave him or her in the hands of God who will do what is right. And God promises, if you are trusting in him, he will wipe every tear from your eyes. And you will never lose hope for anyone. It goes on verse 5. Um, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And that's a blessing. It should be a blessing. You have time to get ready for your death. And I don't mean that you should write a will or you should take out one of these ghastly funeral plans that keep being advertised on daytime TV. No, no, I mean eternal life insurance. I mean to get right with God. And 150 years ago, people were much more conscious of their impending death than they are today. They knew that death might carry them off very really quickly, whether it was tuberculosis or whether it was a cholera epidemic or whatever it might be. But today, I think everyone under the age of about 100 imagines they've got another 10 or 20 years to live and they get things sorted out and they think about it. And it isn't always so. I have at home a picture of my uh, middle daughter's first birthday party. And my father is there, smiling, looking like a proud granddad. He never saw me next morning. He died that very night. And uh, in just a moment, now, now is the time for you to get right with God. If you are not right with God now, do it now. You may not see tomorrow. Who knows? Today, says the psalmist, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. How do you harden your heart when you just say, well, I'm not going to worry about all this stuff. Come, fill the cup. What boots it to repeat as time is slipping underneath our feet? Unborn tomorrow and dead yesterday, why think upon them? Uh, if today be sweet, but the Christian, the Christian who lives above the sun in his heart, he says, for me to live is Christ, for me to die 
is gain. But for, this, for those who, who ignore God, um, this, this one is as good as it's going to get, isn't it? Remember, remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And Abraham says to the rich, the rich man, you had all your good things, and Lazarus had all the evil things, and now you are punished, and he is comforted. And there is a great gulf fixed between the two of them. But people, people who ignore God, they have their good times now, but there's no further reward for them. They will know God only as their judge, not as their saviour. They have spurned Jesus Christ, the only say that they cannot stand in the judgment. No matter how outwardly righteous they may think they are, they may think, well, I do lots of good things, I'm kind to animals, I'm a standing order to Scott Drive Church, I do this, I do that, I do the other. None of these things will stand in the judgment. A man looks at the outward appearance, what a kind of fellow he is, lovely chap. But God looks at the heart. Have you given your heart to Jesus? That is all that matters. And Jeremiah says the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We need a saviour. We need a saviour. And one is so freely, so graciously offered to us in the gospel. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So, how do we who are Christians, how do we react to like this? Well, uh, verses 7 to 8. This is God's remedy for all the stuff that's under the sun. Eat your food with gladness, drink your wine with a joyful heart. But it's now that God favours what you do. And now, let, let's just take a look for a moment. We, we read, uh, Jenny read for us very kindly, uh, 1 Peter 1 just now. And let's just have a look at this. This is what we have. The, the world hasn't got. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as the one whom, whom we have put our trust in, alive and reigning in heaven right now. And through him, you and I have an inheritance, an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade. It can't be eaten away by inflation. It can't be wiped out by a stock market crash. It can't be destroyed by floods or, or, or war or whatever it may be. It's reserved there in heaven for you. It's got your name upon it. And you yourself are shielded, says Peter, by the almighty power of God until the coming of the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this, he says, you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Even though that, you could greatly rejoice. And this is what Solomon said. <coughs> and, and really, a miserable Christian ought to be a contradiction in terms. Now I know, and perhaps you are thinking, wasn't it just a couple of weeks ago we read about uh, better, to go to, better to go to funerals and go to parties and so forth? We are supposed to be serious-minded folk. We are supposed to take these things into account when we go to a funeral. We see there the fate of all the living, and we should take it to heart. But for ourselves, those who have trusted in Christ, for whom to live is Christ, to die is gain, we can rejoice. We can rejoice. Our temporal blessings are doubly sweet because they come from God. Our food, our drink, whatever measure of health we have, they are all God's good gifts to us. His gracious provision to us. And it's base ingratitude to complain that we can't all enjoy sirloin steak and, uh, for supper every day. And I, I, I don't know about you, I wonder how many people have uh, stopped watching the news because it's always so grim. Yeah, and the BBC and the ITV, they always seem to manage to find someone, whatever the news is, <coughs> find someone who's worse off because of it, and who's, who's complaining of how unfair life is, how miserable they are. Brothers and sisters, let us eat and drink whatever we can afford with joy and with thanksgiving. For God has promised, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And he goes on, uh, <coughs> verse 9a, Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life. And here I think meaningless is the wrong translation. I think it should be your fleeting life. Your fleeting life. Um, that, that, you, uh, that God has given you under the sun. It's a fleeting life. but not necessarily meaningless. I'll come back to that in just a moment. But interestingly, wasn't it Solomon who had all these hundreds of wives? Well, this Solomon had uh, uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, what's he doing here? Well, maybe. 
maybe just at the end of his life, he looked with envy at his humblest subjects who found happiness with one life, one wife or one husband who they loved and who loved them. I think Lee spoke of this a little while ago. But did he find out that all these <coughs> wives and concubines that he had, there was not one who loved him for himself, rather than for the wealth and position that came with being Mrs. Solomon? And as I say, meaningless might be better translated fleeting or insubstantial. Your life is fleeting. But if you know Christ, better yet, if you are known by Christ, your life is not meaningless. Mm -hmm. uh, in the language of the Westminster Confession, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. We can enjoy our God forever. Isn't that a great thing to think about? So in our lives out here we glorify and we give all the glory to Him. And by our words, our deeds, everything we can do, we seek to glorify Him. But we can also enjoy Him, enjoy Him right now, and we can enjoy Him forever. And this we do in all our marriages, in all our work. Before the fall, work was easy and delightful. There were no, there were no weeds, or there were no thorns in the Garden of Eden before the fall. But now it's different. And, and Solomon describes work as toilsome labour under the sun. And it often is. It often is. Now, some of you may know that I'm given to quoting from 1960s and 70s pop songs. So I'll give you another one. If you, if you know which one it is, you can come tell me afterwards. There is no prize. But uh, you used to think it was so easy. You used to think that it was so easy. But you're trying. You're trying now. One more year and then you'll be happy. One more year and then you'll be happy. But you're crying. You're crying now. And so it is with many people that are working, working so hard and they're just chasing their tails round and round. And I've been in business and I know exactly what that is. And Solomon says, you might as well give it your best shot. If you don't know the law, give it your best shot in business. Because there's no, uh, there, there, there's, there, there's, there's no working or planning or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. So you might as well do, give it your best shot. But not all of us are called to be pastors or missionaries or evangelists, but all of us can live for God in, in whatever we do. I was going to choose a, a, a very ancient hymn to sing today, but uh, got cut out. But I'd, I'd just like to uh, uh, just quote some verses from a hymn by a man called George Herbert, who lived a very, very, very long time ago. Teach me, my God, and King, in all things thee to see, and what I do in anything to do it as for thee. All men thee partake. Nothing can be so mean which with this tincture, for thy sake, will not grow bright and clean. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and the action fine. I was told a story um, some years ago about um, a Scottish, uh, some Scottish uh, divines, um, meeting in a big presbytery or synod or whatever it was, and they were there and they were discussing uh, the scriptures. And they came to this saying of Paul, uh, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing. And they were trying to, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? How, how can we pray without ceasing? And they were arguing this up and down. And there was this, this young uh, servant girl who was going in and out amongst them, uh, cleaning up after them, giving them food and drink or whatever they needed. And in the end, one of them says, you there, do, do you know what it means? And she said, I said, I think I do. She said, well, I woke up this morning. The sun was just coming up above the hill, and I prayed that the sun of righteousness would ride, ride upon me with healing in his wings. When I had my little a bit of porridge in the morning, I prayed that God would feed my soul as well as my body. And when I came in here to clean the room for you, I prayed that God would cleanse my heart through the Holy Spirit. And so I go all through the day and give thanks to God, praying in Him in everything I do. And always come back and say, Yes, that's it, that's it. I hope they gave her a big tip at the end. Uh, but they, was, they were Scotsmen, so I wouldn't count them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here we are. And we can live for God. Everything we do, we can do as if it were for God, whatever it may be. Uh, whether it's cleaning, cleaning the church or whether it's making some big business deal or whatever it may be, we can do it for God.
And finally, verse 11, verses 11 and 12. Then. Uh, all your brilliance, all your cleverness may come to nothing. I, I was thinking about this. Imagine setting up a hugely successful chain of blacksmiths at the end of the 19th century. Huge chain of blacksmiths, just as motor cars started to come in. Imagine being the boss of Kodak, just, just as digital photography was invented. Imagine inventing the best type, typewriter in the world, just as word processors arrived. Whatever you do, time and chance happens to everything. You do not know whether your work is going to prosper or it's not. Or even if nothing like that happens, you might be on the very cusp of success and just struck down by some debilitating illness or fatal disease. And the parable of the rich, rich fool, this man saying, I've got all this money now, what shall I do with all these crops? I know I've got to build bigger barns. And I've got to get in there. Then I shall be fine, I can retire and I can live happily. And God says to him, you fool, this very night your life will be required of you. And then who will get all this stuff that you've accumulated? And people will ask him, hey, how much did he leave? Well, you know the answer to that, don't you? He left it all. The whole lot. Only one life. Only past, only what's done for God will last. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts.